everybody. Welcome to the NATRC Let's Ride uh, seminar series for 2021. Um, I know we had a gap of about an extra month in here that wasn't planned, but thank you for your patience. Um, we now have uh, Patsy Connor, who is going to be giving us um, a review of the latest obstacle challenge. And for those of you who didn't participate, um, uh, some ideas on how to do these various obstacle challenges that we did have. Patsy Connor has uh, been a longtime member of NATRC. She started writing in about 1976 with, with us, and she started working on her judge's card in the 1980s. Uh, she has been one of our uh, favorite judges uh, around the country and has been very helpful to many of our writers. Uh, Patsy, uh, if you'll take over now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I wanna first of all thank uh, Jamie Diedrich and Bill Wingle for helping me put this together. Um, Jamie and I have been almost in constant contact the last whatever two days. But anyhow, I think we have a good presentation here that I hope it does what you're expecting, but I'll talk about that as we get started. I want to say good evening and welcome to another webinar that's offered by NHRC. Tonight, we will be focusing on uh, the skills that we uh, witnessed when we did the obstacle challenge set one. And this is a deep breaking on what we look for and giving you some tips for success in the future. So here we go. Uh, I think just a little bit of uh, information about why I did what I did. One of the things that I saw when we were doing the uh, doing the judging is I see that there's sometimes a little bit of confusion on how to administer AIDS, um, what your seat looks like, you know, what, how you sit on your horse, and how you administer your cues. So those are some things that I'm going to be talking about, and also what do some of these um, challenges look like, like the side pass or the back? What should it look like? What should my horse look like when we're doing it? So Jamie and I worked hard trying to come up with the pictures. Uh, that's a challenge right there. But anyhow, that's what we're going to be trying to look for. So here we go. Um, the very first challenge was that you were going to demonstrate uh, an NHRC check in and check out and your in hand presentation, how that's done. And uh, there is a standardized way of doing it. And it, when you go to a ride, you will, the vet judges and the horsemanship judges pretty much follow the same format. And I'm trying to talk through that as we go. Um, so here we go with what we're going to be looking for. The very first thing that you will be requested to do is to have your horse well groomed and make sure that even his hooves are clean, his eyes and his nose are ready to be examined because you're going to be presenting him to the veterinarian judge, veterinary judge, and, um, and the horsemanship judge will be there also to be looking at your horse for different uh, horsemanship, things like his grooming, how the halter fits, things like that and also how you handle your horse. So he's gonna check your horse over. And by the way, there are there are male and female vet judges, but I'm just gonna to try to stick with he. Sorry, sorry girls. <laughs> so anyhow, the veterinarian judge will check your horse all over from head to hoof. So the horsemanship judge is also going to check your horse by rubbing, you know, I, I rub my hands all over the horse in the places where the saddle and the bridle, all the places where the tack will fit. I'm going to check all of those out because I want to make sure that they're clean, no dirt, nothing in there that will rub and cause any any uh, soreness of the rubs. Um, Patsy, I think we lost your audio. Well, what do we do now? There we are. <laughs> okay. If you could back up about 30 seconds, that would okay. be good. Checking under the saddle and the bridle. Oh. Is it on my end or what? 
What I think it's on my end, actually. I have a slow internet. Um, just keep going. Um, if people can hear her, um, if people cannot hear her, please put something in the chat and otherwise I'll assume that it's me. Um, okay. Sorry for interrupting. Okay, that's something I forgot to mention in the introduction. I want, if you have questions, we, we appreciate that you would have a question. So if you want to ask a question, go to your chat button and record, you know, tell Tell us what your question is. We won't answer it at the moment. We will answer questions. I will answer questions at the end and we'll go through them one by one. Some of them may be duplicates, but we'll, we'll try to get through all of them at the end of the presentation. I think we'll be done in time, okay? So here we are. Uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, in this picture, uh, Angie is uh, facing the vet judge. He's He is on, the near side of the horse and beginning his examination. And Angie is standing slightly off to the side, never, never, never in front of the horse. And she's holding the lead line at an acceptable and appropriate length that allows the horse to relax and you still have control of him. Uh, let's see, she's, she's keeping her eye on the vet judge and will uh, follow him from one side to the other. So the horse is alert and calm, the ears are up. So for safety, Angie stands uh, on the same side as the vet judge, uh, slightly up here, she's again slight, slightly off to the side and she's followed him around to the uh, off side of the horse. Why is this a safety issue? Well, if that horse starts to act up and and want to bolt off, uh, she can pull the horse's head towards her. And if you notice where the vet judge is right now, I think you can see my cursor. He's right, right back here. Uh, when she pulls the horse's head towards her, the horse's hind end will move away. So that's the safety keeping. Sometimes that judge is leaning over and picking up a leg or you know, doing something under, under the horse. So we want to make sure that horse's hind end moves away, hind quarters moves away. The vet now uh, is going to be back on the, uh, on the near side of the horse. And he's, he starts to be a, do a thorough, starting the thorough examination. He'll be noting the baselines of of all the vital signs. Uh, he will be checking the following things, uh, mucous membranes and capillary refill. Both of these are done in the horse's mouth. So that's something that you need to practice at home, making sure that that horse will let you put your fingers in his mouth and lift his lips and such. Uh, and Patsy, then, yes. I'm gonna interrupt real briefly. We do have one question from Deborah uh, before we get too far along. Uh, she noticed that the uh, chain under the horse's jaw, could you make a comment about presenting with a uh, chain on your horse? Uh, it's just a, a an extra secure. She, uh, it, it's a way to, you know, keep the horse's attention if necessary. Um, there, there isn't any pros or cons one way or the other. It depends on the horse and what the rider knows, how much, you know, how much you need to have for that particular horse. Does that answer the question? I suspect. Not, huh? you think so? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so um, where was I? Okay, so now he's moved from the horse's head and mouth down to uh, the horse's neck where he's gonna check the jugular vein or yeah, jugular refill is what it is. And then, uh, He'll, he'll go on down just a little bit further and check for, he'll give a little pinch on the neck and the, the skin will stand up a little bit. And that's called skin tinting. And that's checking for the horse's hydration. Then he goes on down to the, uh, to the barrel of the horse and uses his stethoscope to check for gut sounds. And then on around the hind quarters, checking for muscle tone. It's the uh, soundness check, I have these pop-up things. Are these, are these showing up on the 
on the presentation. No, there's, no they're good. Uh, we don't see this. Okay, good. All right. So the sound, soundness check continues when the vet runs his hands over the horse's withers, back, loins, and girth. And they usually do it on both sides of the horse and checking to see if there's any rubs or sores or any tenderness or anything unusual that might cause some problems when you put a saddle on and go down the trail. The hooves are, will be examined. In most cases, that, that happens when they're checking the legs. Uh, the the uh, vet will look, look at all four legs, usually running their hands down, uh, down the horse's legs, checking for any uh, soreness or uh, the possible lameness is there. Okay, we're not moving on. I don't know what happened here. There we go. Okay, so uh, the next place you go after he's finished everything, then all around the horse, he will instruct you to trot straight away. And this is important because he's watching the horse's way of going and will be, and there's a possibility of seeing lamenesses here. So it's very critical if you do uh, that just exactly like you're, you're, you're showing your horse. So you need to trot in a straight line, straight away from the judge. The best way to figure out how to do that, if you standing in front of the vet, look out to the point, they usually tell you, you know, go out to that rock or go out to that pylon. And uh, if they you get your eye on that and start to trot all the way, you know, towards that pylon, keeping your eye on that pylon as you go. So trotting straight away, you will maintain a consistent gait that is brisk enough. I mean, I want to emphasize that uh, for a good evaluation. So many times you want to trot. Uh, we have riders who trot their horse out very slowly, and it's very difficult to detect any problems when it's so slow. So in fact, it's time to make it may it may make the horse look lame. Then you hold the rope lightly with just enough slack that allows the horse to use, to use his head and move freely. You can see this here, there's plenty of slack. It also keeps the horse away from you. That's another training thing you need to do is to make sure that the horse doesn't get into your space. So the horsemanship judge also watches your presentation as you go. So at the end of the straight line trot out, you you will ask you will trot your horse in circles, and you'll usually be asked to trot your horse in uh, in in one or two circles in both directions. Um, this this is one more time to observe lameness. Angie is lunging her horse in the, in round circles of a consistent size at a brisk, even gait that allows the horse to move relaxed and freely. She keeps control. This is interesting. Okay, okay. She keeps control uh, of, uh, of the lunge line in her, in her right hand, leading the horse with her left. Note that the horse here is not pulling on the line, but at a trot that is neither too fast nor too slow. Angie offers a good length of line, but controls the excess, not allowing it to drag on the ground. Are we doing okay so far? No question. Uh, I think we're good. And that's okay. uh, no All right. question. Here's two examples of, of circles. Uh, the one on the left, it's large and the horse is moving freely and gives a good opportunity for the vet to see how the horse moves. Uh, he's also checking way of going too. So uh, the one on the right shows the horse on a very tight circle, which makes it hard to move freely and can often make the horse look lame. So get out there. Uh, it doesn't need to be a huge circle but you need to have it enough so that they can move out freely at a, at a good, good trot or a good gait. So here's safety is always a huge issue with, with anything we do within HTRC. 
And this is something that uh, was judged at, at the challenge. You always, always, always turn the horse away from you. This is, uh, you should have learned this in 4-H or whatever other pony club you belong to. The pictures here are compliments of the uh, Certified Horsemanship Horseman Association. Uh, the top one shows them move, the boy moving the horse uh, away from himself. No danger of being stepped on like the boy in the bottom picture. In the, pic in the photograph to the right, um, you can see she's pulling the horse into herself, which in itself, could, and the horse is behind her, so she doesn't see what the horse is doing. So that could be an issue, a safety issue, because she, if the horse spooks and turns into her, she would be probably knocked down. This is also, could, she could be stepped on as the horse continues to move into her. So two things to consider. And if you haven't been practicing it at home, you need to start, make it automatic. Uh, uh, Patsy, we have one question about circles. Okay. Uh, this is from Chrissy Knight. What is considered a gated horse, uh, what is considered with gated horses when they have extra gears and may change from gait to trot or pace? Well, as long as the horse is, I think, moving in one of their gates that they're comfortable with and can be consistent with whatever they choose. Um, some, I, I know some gated horses, uh, the people who ride them have trained them to trot in a, you know, when they're presenting their horses. Others just make sure that they are doing one of the gates that is brisk enough that will show whether the horse is, you know, lame or off in any way. Does that answer your question? I, I don't get a lot of feedback right away, but so I'm assuming that it is. Okay. Um, All right. Uh, well, come back maybe, if you have another question or yeah, want some clarification. Yeah. Okay. The main, the main, as Patsy said, the main answer is pick a, pick a gate or pick a trot and be consistent throughout your presentation. That'll make the vet um, okay. happier. So here's two. two errors that you need to be aware of, you know, make sure you know what you're doing. Trot straight toward the judge. But in these two pictures, what can the vet see? He wants to see the legs. Now, if the rider or the handler is right in front of the horse, he can't see the legs, or he only sees one at that point. And then in this picture, uh, the rider is angling back towards the vet judge. So they're, they're hiding some of the legs part of the time. So that would be inconsistent for the vet to be able to really evaluate that horse. You want to show your horse to the best possible, you know, in the best possible way, and to get a good evaluation. So here are another safety, safety. So look at the, uh, on the left side, look at the man's left hand he has the rope coiled around his hand. You need to fold it, in other words, like loop it back and forth, uh, the excess lead, so that there is no possibility of a coil. And I know I see this all over the place, you know, in the, especially if I'm around rodeo, There, everybody seems to carry that. But I have witnessed firsthand people getting their hands caught in the rope because the horse bolted and pulled, jerked that line all the way out of the person's right hand and, and then through the left hand and resulted in loss of fingers. So keep them, you know, folded back and forth, but not ever in a coil. And then on the right side, this just seems to be a disaster happened, waiting to happen. Uh, you can be tripped, you can be entangled, just all kinds of things. Come up with a way that you can keep your, your line uh, controlled and, and efficient so that if you have to bring it in, shorten it, it, it pulls back and forth easily. Or if you have to feed it out, it feeds out easily. So keep these kind of things from happening. 
Uh, and this one, I've offered this just a little comic relief, okay? <laughs> this, I, I came across this while we were searching for pictures, and I just had to include it. This poor person is really in trouble. He's ensnared around his body and up, you know, between his legs and everywhere. So I just had to add that just for a little comic relief. So we move on to uh, the lateral movement uh, of the side pass, which is a lateral movement uh, in which the horse moves sideways towards a specified object. Now, there is the, the side pass is, is a very uh, handy thing to have your horse know how to do and for you to control the horse doing it. Uh, you notice in the very first picture, the horse's front legs are crossed over. This is very acceptable uh, in, in the classic way, but it is not required for trail riding because it, it is very difficult to do that kind of thing because they are not real, well, I guess I would say they would not be real steady on their feet with their, their legs crossed over. Um, they also cross over their hind legs in that classical way of doing it. So you know on the trail where it's uneven, rocky, uh, full of brush and everything that you want them to be as probably as stable as possible. In the second slide, the horse is relaxed and is paying attention to the rider because his ears are, uh, he has his ear turned towards the rider, the handler. She cues, cues the horse uh, at, at the side about where your leg would go, where you would put your heel if you were mounted. And you can see the horse continues to step aside. So he's got, in the second one, his legs are together. He takes a step to the right in the third slide and then brings the legs together uh, next to the mounting block in the fourth. And then the the uh, handler is uh, making sure that the horse is square before she attempts to mount. Now to teach your horse to do that, you need to, if he isn't doing it and you're struggling, you're pushing on him and doing all kinds of things to make him move over, just kind of back up and practice at home and try for just one little step at a time. Make your cues consistent, no matter what you're using. I started out using my fingers on the side where my heel would be, and I just started pushing gently, not a steady pull, but a little kind of a push, relax, push, relax, until finally the horse gives even a tiny step. Praise him, pet him, walk him around, come back and try it again and continue that until the horse begins to respond more and more readily and working up to more than one step. Now the mount, Ugh, we all have to get on that horse, don't we? Now, <laughs> I have to tell you, I can't, I, I, this horse is at least 17 hands high. So I know she needs a mounting block. <laughs> And she's done a beautiful job here getting on. I, I do want to point out one thing. Uh, we've got a mounting block when you're doing the side pass. We've got a mounting block here to, to uh, model the mounting. I wanted to point out that there is some research that says that it is better to use something to mount with, like a mounting block, a log, a rock, something other than mounting what we could say from the ground, you know, flat footed on the ground, put your foot in the stirrup and get on. It causes extra stress on the horse's back and, and loins when you are pulling on the horse to get on. So we uh, are recommending it, you know, anytime you have to, if there isn't a mounting block available, then try to find a place around wherever you are in the woods or wherever, you know, a rock, a log, look for dips in the ground, look for little ditches, um, you know, anything that you can place your horse in uh, and 
that it gives you moves that stirrup a little lower for you to get in and you don't have to pull so hard to get up in the saddle. So uh, just talking through what's going on here in the first slide, uh, important that you have your reins over the horse's head and that they are, are, are adjusted, but only some slight slack. You want to have be able to have some control if the horse starts to, to leave, to walk away if necessary. Um, the rider begins by putting her foot into the stirrup. And then in the second uh, slide, she uh, is, begins to rise and lift her left leg over, uh, over the saddle and the horse's rump. She's got her weight in the stirrup and uh, she, as she puts her leg over the saddle to, to straddle the saddle, it is, her leg is high enough where she doesn't hit the candle and she doesn't drag her foot or her leg over the horse's rump. And then she, uh, her leg is on the other side of the horse and she must, you just learn to drop down lightly. Don't just plop down. And sometimes it, it I, we've seen riders, you know, plop down so hard and heavy that the horse kind of goes, bah, you know, so make sure that you light, you know, do as light as possible. And so uh, the rider relaxes down softly into the saddle and she's ready to ride. Um, you notice that she's looking up, keeping eye, keeping her eyes on the horse's ears and, uh, you know, being ready for anything there. So my, a nice mouth here. She put good, a good comment on that. So then the next thing, okay, okay, all kinds of stuff here. It's blocking my, okay, okay, ah, tell me about Biggest. Okay, now, one of the things that, you know, we look at when we're judging obstacles, uh, other than, the on ground things. When you're going to be on the horse, we need to check several things. And of course, it is your your position in the saddle. And to see, you know, what what is what is the basis of making sure that you are riding in a balanced and light seat. This adjustment of the stirrups is critical to to make sure that you have balance and have a firm seat and safe seat. Um, here's how you can check for the correct length. I mean, I've seen all kinds of things from too short to way too long, etc. So we want to make sure that you know how to check uh, your stirrup length. So look, this is the English saddle on the left, and you put your hand right over that spot where the, the stirrup leather joins the saddle. There's a bar there that you put your uh, put your stirrup in, and then you pull the stirrup itself, the iron, and up to your armpit. And if it fits into your armpit with no slack, that's the best length for you to ride English. To ride Western, it's hard. It would be hard to check the, the saddle uh, the stirrup length that way. So you mount up. And then you stand in the stirrups with your heel, your ankles flexed so that your heel is just slightly below the stirrup. And if you notice the, the, there's an arrow pointing and right here at your bottom, it says there's a hand's width there. That's the proper uh, adjustment for you. This, this is a good straight line from the, the your ear to the shoulder to the hip to the heel. This is a good picture here. So that's how you check. Now here's another way to look at it. This is uh, English. So once you're mounted, it's easy to check. So when you're seated correctly, you drop your stirrups and let your leg yeah. hang down naturally. You know, you don't, you don't, don't try to hold it up or anything. 
but your stirrup iron, the tread of the iron should hit just below your ankle, right there. That's the correct adjustment there. Now this one, dressage riders always ride longer. This would be short, and there are some instances where you would ride a short stirrup, but mostly for trail, you want to have one that is just at that medium level where your stirrup is below your ankle. Um, I think that, oh, for the best placement of the foot, you know, where does my foot go when I put my stirrup, I mean, foot in the stirrup? The iron or the the tread of the stirrup should fit, uh, the ball of your foot should be on the stirrup's tread. The ball of your foot, the widest part of your foot is on the stirrup. I think that, I hope that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Now the next thing you need, to, this is the other thing, are, are your, you know, are, are they, are your stirrups too long or are they too short? How does that affect your, your riding if they're too short? Um, your seat is insecure. Look at this this girl. Um, hers, hers are very short. Now, I'm you know, if any of you have, have ridden a lot you, and done any jumping, you know you ride a shorter stirrup, but you don't want to do this on the trail. This this seat is very insecure. It pushes her weight to the back. Person, there it is. It pushes her seat to the back, and therefore you see the fleshy part of her bottom is is right over there, and giving her weight goes down on the horse's loins. The next is to look at what happens when it's too long. His base of support is reduced, making it difficult for the rider to maintain his balance, either to the front or rear. And if you see this kind of situation, you will notice that the rider has trouble staying one way or the other. It's difficult to have the right leg contact. And if it's if they're not right, it, okay, I can't read this, but I hope you can. It, it's, it's it makes it these positions make it you know, impossible or very difficult to properly cue the horse. Okay. Bill, can this top bar that I'm seeing, can it go down without turning me off? Um, it, it's usually when you move your mouse out of the way, the bar will go out of the way. Um, but, um, or on the very top, it's, there is a, there are a couple things up there that are fixed, but I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you're seeing. I don't think we're seeing it. Ah, here we go. I'm going down here. Oh. Okay. That's where um, I used to get it. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. There we go. So there you go. I, I mean, you probably could see it, but I couldn't. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So moving on. Oh, okay. Here we go. Nice so here is a photograph I wanted you all to see of somebody with their stirrups too long. I mean, she is reaching down as far as she can, and her toes are on in the stirrups. So it makes her very unbalanced. So you want to, know, that, that isn't a very good position. And I'm sure she's going to be tired when she finishes this ride. So uh, challenge number two, so side pass mounting. Uh, uh, and then offside mount and then back three steps. So one of the common complaints is my horse won't back. So what can I do? I'm going to ask you to back up and think about what do you know about cueing your horse? What is the best way uh, to, to communicate with your horse? Now, one of the things that is so important is that it has to be consistent, whatever you're doing. And I have here so that you should be, okay, I lost my cursor again. Yeah. Um, anyhow, you need to learn the basics. As you sit on your horse, you have four ways to communicate with your horse. These are called natural aids because you have them. Wherever you are, you have them. You have your weight, 
your legs, your hands, and your voice. Then the question still, how do I use these to tell my horse I want to back? Well, let's start with your weight. The horse responds to the slightest shifts in the distribution of your weight. The horse tries to stay in balance with your weight. Horses will learn to respond to your weight. Uh, think about the times when you have been riding along and you look over off in the distance off to the right and all of a sudden you feel like your horse is moving off to the right. Uh, just leaning slightly forward will increase the gait. So those are the kind of things that if you, you know, become aware of what you're doing and what the horse is doing. So if you lean, you know, if, if you just turn your head, that causes your weight to shift. And so it's sending a message to the horse. Now here's what you need to know about uh, when you are sitting on your horse. No, I went too far, sorry. Wait, I wanted to move down. Anyway, so when you're sitting on your horse to cue for the back, you sit tall with the weight distributed down through your heels. You only need to think back and you will sit a little bit deeper in the saddle. And when this happens, and here I am telling you, when this happens, the horse is going to sense that and quite often will begin to move away from your weight under your weight because you've moved back and take he takes it as a cue. Let me see if I can where did my curse there it is. I'm gonna move this one up here. So you're sitting back you're, and you will sit deeper in the saddle. And so the next thing you have is your your hands, which of course are the reins. The reins regulate your forward motion. Tension on both reins tells the horses what is expected. It tells them to slow down, to stop, back up, whatever you want them to do. So be, but you have to be gentle when cueing with the reins. Cues should be done with a give and take motion and never a steady hard pull. When you do that, there's an iron, something iron, metal in that horse's mouth. And it, and it, in most cases, if you have a severe bit, it becomes very, very painful. One of the things to caution you about is that a common thing to do when you're asking for the back is that you want to pull on the reins and kick at the same time. That confuses and frustrates the horse and sometimes can even make them angry. It's, it's, the confuse, you're confusing the cues by telling them to go, but don't go. So, you know, stop, don't stop. So make sure that when you're doing the cues, you do one and then the other. And always not steady pulls. They're always alternate, same thing with the, the, uh, the leg cues. Squeeze, you know, ask, and release, both with the rein and the leg. And then the voice, you use it to calm or praise your horse. You probably, and there's other ways that, that are your voice that aren't really your voice, but you're probably most familiar with clucking, like, or kissing, the kissing sound, used to get the horse's attention or usually to go faster. So you can also train your horse to respond to certain maneuvers by telling them what you want to do. So when you have the horse side passing either on the ground or uh, mounted, you can say uh, side pass when you when they're side passing on the ground, you're going to say you point to the side and ask them to move and say over, 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 or side, side. You keep repeating as she takes a step. You can do the same thing with the back, or you can signal your horse to trot. Uh, when you're ready to trot. You do all the signals with the reins and the legs and then you can say trot. That says, okay, it's now, it's ready to go. So these are, these kind of things are all learned from groundwork. 
early on. So how do I use these to tell my horse I want him to bet? Let's see if we can put all of these together. It's kind of a puzzle. So let's, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna alert your horse that you are going to do something. I, you sit tall, you sit up tall and that makes your weight shifts back a little bit and your reins are ready to cue the horse. If the horse feels this is a cue, he may take a step forward. Now don't punish him because that's the beginning of a back. You have what is called impulsion. He has moved in response to something you cued him for. Use just a gentle tug on the reins to just say, uh-uh, not that way. And then continue with slight leg squeeze or bump to indicate you want him to continue to move. But one step at a time, back. And then you ask and release each time you want another step. I hope that makes sense for you. You can softly say back when making a soft contact with the reins. What you're doing is actually blocking forward motion with a soft give and take, and it's and you never have a consistent pull. And I can't see what that says. You think you can read it? Okay, I'm going to go back because I'm going to miss it. Wow, he's staying fast. Okay, all right. I'm thinking that last line there says to. Bill, can you read that last line? Uh, yeah, be patient, don't rush, reward yeah. him for each good attempt. Yes, I, I can't emphasize that more, be patient. If you don't get it the first time, it might be best that you walk around, do something else for a while and then come back to it. Because the more frustrated you get, the worse it gets for him. And it'll be harder the next time you come back to do this. Can't, I can't get that. Anymore. Yeah, and that was the last line. Okay. All right, that's it. Okay. All right, going on. Okay, here's a couple of examples uh, from a trail ride, a real one. Uh, I want to describe just a little bit about this situation. Is that in this, uh, this, this was a path that the judge uh, actually, the vet judge uh, created through this cluster of rocks on a hillside uh, at an Oklahoma ride. And this is a very difficult one because we're right here in the very first uh, scene here. The horse is backing up. You can see his, his, his hindquarters are a little bit tucked under as he's starting to, to start up this slight hill and his head is down, his mouth is closed. He seems to be relaxed, but remember that the back is a difficult maneuver for your horse. He can't see directly behind him, so he trusts you implicitly. And as, the, as they continue through each one of these rocks, you had to go around them and down, and you know it was, it was a very complicated uh, backing situation. Um, uh, to back correctly, the horse should round his back, tilting his hindquarters with the weight with his weight in his haunches. So the head should be relaxed. I'm going to go again and down and not showing resistance. In situations such as the use of, of your legs, in such as this, the use of your legs guide the hindquarters through those rocks. I think if you look at both of these horses. They, uh, the, uh, their head is down and relaxed, their mouth is closed, the hindquarters are rounded. So they, they are doing their best. Now, each one of the riders, though, they have, look at how they're holding their, their reins. 
is pretty much a straight line from the horse that's from the bit to the rider's elbow in both situations to the bit to the elbow. Her hands are a little bit high, but pretty good. And she's you know, she is cueing the horse a little bit far back, but what I'm assuming here is that she's guiding his hindquarters to move around a rock. So if you had this whole sequence, you could probably see that this is a pretty good example of what to do. Okay, now this is what you do not want to see. And if you ever see your horse doing this, you know, it tells you that you're too heavy on the reins. You're pulling back too much. Uh, he's resisting. So there's three degrees of resistance. These horses, this, these are three degrees of resistance. These horses are feeling a steady pull on the bit while your legs tell him to go forward. The pulling on the rein causes the horses to tense his spine and ask for relief. This horse on the left, in a way, makes me think of those dude horses I've had to ride a couple of times. And that that horse has his head down and his mouth is open. He is pulling on those reins down. And if he does it in, in a hard enough way, he'll just about pull you out of the saddle. But his mouth is open saying this hurts. Now the next horse has his neck up. It's braced. He's braced and his neck and head are raised and his mouth is open. And the third one, it's a sign of confusion. It's a harsher bit, and it's a steady, hard pull. And you can see the, uh, there we go. Uh, okay. Then here, you can see this, it, it is, it has a shank bit, so a curved kind of bit, and it straight line, you can see the pull. Okay. If you if you have that happening, you got to re-examine what you're doing, how you're administering your aids. Think about that ask and release, just small ask and release, and the horse will eventually start to respond to you. But if they've been through these kind of things, it might be take it might take a little while to get there. So I want to move to just a little bit about your actual position. And you, we're, we're talking, we talked about that we want you to be riding balanced and light. Now, as shown here in this picture, uh, this rider is sitting tall in the saddle. She's not stiff. Uh, she's sitting on her seat bones in balance. Her alignment is illustrated by the line. You can see these lines are drawn right here from her ear to her shoulder to her hip and the back of her ankle and back of her heel. Uh, that's a that's good alignment. Um, now to check your leg position without bending over, look down. She would just drop her eyes, maybe her head forward a little bit. Drop her eye, look over your knee. You should just be able to see the tip of your of your uh, of your boot, the toe of your boot. That means you've got you've got your leg in a good, in a good position. And there's a straight line from her elbow to the bit. Good position here. She will be riding. She said, "You are in balance with the horse when you're when you're like this." and you're moving with him. It makes you more effective and can improve the horse's way of going. A good way to visualize your position is to imagine the horse is dropping out from under you. Will you end up standing up? That's been my mantra for a long time when I'm talking to, to riders at briefings when I'm judging. It's one of the things that was taught to me by the old military sergeants that were teaching me how to ride way back a long time ago. So there's clues for you. Try to establish your light and balance seat that way. Now, I will tell you one thing. There's so much more to this. If you don't have, some of your saddles will not allow you to ride like that. 
And barring buying a new saddle, I don't know too much about how you can do it. There are a few things you can do that could help, but you just got to have the right saddle that will allow you to ride light and balanced with that, that straight line there. So if the next uh, challenge is, is at the trot and to transition from the trot, from the trot, uh, walk to the trot, you need to alert your horse that you're going to do something by a squeeze or a bump of your leg. Your hands are gentle and elastic, not pulling back, but using a soft feel on the mouth. The amount of pressure applied, applied excuse me, is only to regulate the rate and direction that you're going. Maintain a balanced and light seat at a trot, keeping your ankles relaxed, absorbing the shock of, of a bouncy trot. The trot can be made more comfortable by posting, rise, posting for a rising trot. Now, the other half of this is uh, what about gated horses out on the trail? Uh, some horses are gated and that's okay. Some of our, you know, this, this, this is a, a national champion horse and even a President's Cup horse. So they, they take home the honors too. They have faster gates than a walk and will be asked for one of those gates that will show how they move. And, and uh, <coughs> that would be equal to what our, uh, our trotting horse will do. The queuing and rider seat are basically the same for the gated horse, but you do not sit back in the saddle like you see on the show ring gated horses. You notice this, this man's, he's got, he has his ear here, shoulder, shoulder, yeah. Okay, stop. Shoulder, shoulder. He's leaning forward slightly because his horse is moving moving forward at a gate, a faster gate. And so he's in that alignment that we've been talking about. The halt. This one is a booger, I'll tell you. This one is hard. And I want to I want to caution you right here. This is one of the things that if you get too uh, I want to say energetic with get trying to get your horse to back up and he doesn't want to be really careful when they start to get light on the front end that means they're going to rear and that is absolutely one of the most dangerous things you can do with your horse because they will go over backwards with you they want to resist that hard pull on their mouth so this is a really important thing that you're going to do that when you ask for a, a halt or a back i should have said this during the back either a halt or a back do not do the hard, hard pulls. This is where it's critical that you do the ask and release. So you must be riding, riding balanced before stopping in a balanced way. So you're going to sit up, sit deep and slightly back. You're sitting deep and back in the saddle. Your horse may respond to this alone. My horse would do that. I never had to touch the reins. He would stop or back just by me moving my uh, bottom back in the saddle. Add, add a voice cue if necessary and, and mute, use give and take light rain pressure if necessary. So um, I, I guess most of the time we don't, we, we just want to see a control stop. Uh, we don't want the horses being hauled back and such. Uh, look at the lower picture there. That is an absolutely nice picture of a good balanced, uh, a balanced trot just before a balanced stop. The next thing I wanted to offer for you are this, uh, the manual, the, the NATRC Riders Manual, the uh, Horsemanship Composite Manual from the uh, Certified Horsemanship Association, and then my oldie but goodie horsemanship, horse, uh, the cavalry manual of horsemanship and horse mastership. It is, uh, it, I have had that for a hundred years, I think. It was published in 1963. I couldn't find it any place to order. 
except one there was one that you could order for like 800 and some odd dollars but if you keep looking you'll find it someplace i found them in the used bookstores and such so i think that's my that's it um yeah that's it so um we're open for questions do we have enough time bill or did i go i didn't i we're doing good on time we've got uh, easily another five minutes. Um, okay. I'm not seeing any immediate questions. Um, I'll give people not a chance to answer, ask some questions, type some questions before we. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I think Jamie Dietrich is out there. Jamie, do you have anything to add? Um, we do have one question uh, in the chat. Um, does your scoring criteria change based on level or experience? Um, do you judge <laughs> novice differently than cp differently than open differently than the leisure class on no, particular I, challenges I, i'm going to say it as a qualified no i will uh, oh, I, 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 don't know, I don't quite let's see do i score them differently am i easier on 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 less experienced riders um I guess I will probably, I, no, I probably will be judging on different things at different obstacles. I'll put it that way. If you're an inexperienced writer, I won't ask you to do some of the things that are harder, you know, for the more advanced writers. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Jamie, did you have any comments to add? Uh, Jamie says, uh, not offhand, you did great. Um, um, various people are saying, thank you. Thank you for the informative webinar. Uh, I'm not seeing any additional questions. You covered this in great detail, Patsy. It okay. was very good. Okay, good. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was something to put it together, but it is really, it was, it was I, I'm glad I did it. Uh, it helped me double, you know, think more deeply on some of the things that I do when I'm judging. Uh, I want to say to any of you that are out there, if I'm ever wherever you are and you know, and you have questions for me, please don't hesitate. Um, I, my email address is on the on the NATRC website, so please contact me you know, anytime you need, anytime you want to. I'm available. All right. Um, I will uh, we'll call this an end of uh, the webinar. I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, this is, uh, we are doing these webinar series. We're trying to do them uh, once a month, the fourth, fourth Wednesday at 7 p.m. of every month, uh, January through October. Um, as uh, we'll be announcing the next webinar topic uh, coming up soon, I need to talk to a couple people first. But thank you for everybody for attending. Patsy, thank you so much for doing this. Um, it's greatly appreciated. And everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thanks to everybody.